and welcome everybody. Glad to see the weather was good and allowed this many folks to come. Um, I just like to have a picture of, you know, outer space from the Hubble. But uh, just so you know that I'm going to talk about energy and home and uh, reliability or um, responsibility and stuff. This is one of the last slides, so you're in the right place if that's what you want. But we're going to get there <laughs> with a whole bunch of other stuff. And so, uh, in all the space known and yet to be discovered, we have not yet found a place hospitable to nature as we know it and to human life. So why would any sane people <laughs> risk the slow climate apocalypse? This is our blue boat home as a Unitarian going here. We often sing the song Blue Boat Home at the beginning of services about our earth and caring for it. And it's a molten core and then a crust around the core. And the crust has lots of little cracks and different things that like to move. And then a thin layer of water, a thin layer of air. And if this earth right here, you put a business card on it, that's thicker than the air. Um, and then it is circling around a star. And that's our only real source of new energy coming at us. So this is plan A to live here. And plan B oh, is not yet ready. But Elon Musk is talking about his big effing rocket landing on Mars, <laughs> and, and he, that's what he calls it, uh, BFR, uh, and he wants to make life multiplanetary because he's worried. By the way, MIT's come up with a winning program for how do you live there, because it's 96% carbon dioxide. You can't breathe. That's 960,000 parts per million. We're at 400 and we're worried, so, you know, you don't go out there and take a deep breath. Uh, but uh, so this MIT came up with this where that's a city and here's a neighborhood and the neighborhood it's kind of interesting because adopting a lot of principles of some of the best houses it has all this underground space which acts as a climate battery and you can bring heat in and store it there and uh, and you're growing stuff and you've got uh, radiation protection the thing about Mars, very thin atmosphere. Thin atmosphere, big temperature swings, monster temperature swings. Colorado, we have big temperature swings, not like what they have. Okay, so, and he said, we're running the most dangerous experiments in history right now, which is to see how much carbon dioxide the atmosphere can handle before there's a environmental catastrophe. Um, so, I'm going to say, out of the morning's dawn, we get a vision of converting our values into actions. And that's what this is going to be about. Um, and the, the title that Martin came up with for the Flyers was Past the Sustainability in Daily Life. Uh, Phil gave the title I've always used for it when I've given previous versions. But I was going to update it to be How to Fight the Slow Climate Apocalypse, a Personal sustainable energy program. Anyway, the dimensions of the situation, we're going to start out talking about climate, and then about ethics, and then responsibilities which fall out of ethics, and then energy principles. And I like to say, uh, with a mathematical background, you got axioms and theorems. These are the axioms for personal action. The theorems are what you do. And so that's the personal energy practices. And uh, so, again, the Earth, Okay, this is Earth rising. We have sunrise, moonrise. Earth rises if you're someplace else. And that's full Earth. It's always nice if you're on the moon to have a full Earth um, to look at. And then the Earth's water. If you take your uh, uh, wet, dry shop vac and you suck all that up into a big balloon, you get a water balloon about that size. It's about 800 miles across. So that's a good size water balloon. Now, there's a little blue dot, that's the fresh water, okay? Because this is the salt water. Um, now, it all starts with the air. We talk about air and water on the outside. It starts with the air. There's, this is a air quality website 
wacky World's Air Quality Index dot info. Really interesting because you can click on any of these cities and you see in the last hour what all of their pollutants that are local bad pollutants are, um, like uh, particulates 2.5 micron, particulates 10, ozone, NOx, SOx, and carbon monoxide, hourly measurements are on there. So you can really see what the air quality, the local air quality, but there's another thing that I'm gonna call global air quality. And global air quality is the stuff that pervades all the way around pretty much evenly. You got local spots, but they dissipate pretty fast. So the global air quality is the CO2 and the methane. Now, we've been under 300 for maybe 650,000 years, um, but in 1950, when I entered my two-room school in the woods in southern Indiana that had two outhouses out back and a pumping well out front, uh, we crossed that 300. We had not been across it before. So um, now the carbon dioxide levels at the current 403, 405 are uh, likely higher than they've been for 20 million years. 20 million years. I can't remember back that far, but my mind is slipping. Okay, greenhouse gases warm the planet. That's what these are. That's why I call these a global air quality as opposed to the local, which are things that people usually talk about. Now, here's uh, from the place that they get measured on top of Mount Haleakala in uh, Maui. Uh, they've been since 1958, uh, when I was in junior high school, uh, they've been doing these data. And it poked through 350 uh, just a couple years before I took an official retirement. And then it uh, poked through 400 just a couple years ago, but it goes up and down as a sawtooth based on seasonality. In the Northern Hemisphere, we suck carbon dioxide out of the air in the summer because the trees are eating it up and putting out oxygen, all the plants. But in the winter, we put the stuff back and we always are putting back more than we take out. Lots of times to put back more than you take out is good, but when you're putting back bad stuff, more than, that's not good, so we're going up. Anyway, um, now, you could say there are other greenhouse gases than CO2, so why just ball out the CO2? Well, that's the one thing we really have been messing with, and it's what controls the temperature, and therefore, the temperature controls how much of moisture is in there. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, but you get more when it's warmer. So CO2 drives the water vapor, which is greenhouse gas, and uh, CO2 also drives the uh, methane, CH4. And because warming climate causes thaw uh, in the permafrost, and that puts out CO2 and methane, and you go round and round, and we don't want that to run away to the point that we can't stop it, so we gotta get working fast. It's interesting that since Earth Day, we have warmed the planet this much in this way. Now we say overall, you know, We've maybe warmed on the uh, IPCCs, don't do more than two, or better yet, don't do more than one and a half degrees C, that we've already warmed almost one degree C planetarily. But most of that's up north. And the scale here goes out to three degrees C. We're, we're really hot on the top, okay? And uh, it's just kind of interesting to know how that's happening. Um, that's since Earth Day. Not since the IPCC's benchmark, which is around 1950. So um, that's, that's worrisome, because that's where the methane is in the permafrost. Um, and uh, I, I just found a couple of lovely cartoons. This was published, this Pogo. Some of you are old enough to know the cartoon Pogo. Many of you are too young, but uh, he, on, on Earth Day, this was on the first Earth Day in 1970, April 22nd, 1970. We have met the enemy and he is us. And this is so true, it was so true then, it's so true now. The next year, and it says right there, Earth Day 1971, he put the same message over there, but he has a porcupine and him are going through all this litter and polluted pond and everything. And uh, again, he says, yep, son, we have met the enemy and he is us. Well, we've solved in certain dimensions that met the enemy and he is us because 
The garbage brought disease, we've learned to dispose of it. Sewage, polluted waters, we've learned to treat it, although current administration is trying to get rid of a lot of clean water laws. Uh, local air pollution, which harms health, we've really worked to reduce the local, but it wasn't totally understood back then about the global air quality, the CO2 and the methane that has the climate effects. Uh, now, I want to go and get perspective. Our planet's been here about 4.6 billion years, and uh, I don't know what day of the month and what month of the year it actually started, but you know, 4.6 billion years, something like that. And Venus, Mars, and Earth all had climates that were basically the same. And now we got one that's much better. So let's just think a little bit about how that might have happened. So, uh, so here's the much better. We've naturally sequestered carbon. We've taken the CO2 that was 96, 96 and a half, 97 percent, and we've put most of it down into the ground. Well, we did that because over time we got some single cell life, and then it got to be multiple cell, and then we got some sea life that with shells and by gum. When things die and they go to the bottom, they turn into, well, if it's shells, it turns into limestone, calcium carbonate. Okay, carbon is in there. Um, and uh, so that uh, gets out to 550 million, which we pick up right here. And then we get more involved and more involved, and we even get up to dinosaurs. And then, of course, dinosaurs had a meteor that bothered them, uh, so to speak. Uh, and we're out here at zero before present at that far side, and this is just expanding out of that. Um, so uh, all of these things went down and became coal, natural gas, oil, limestone. And we're now trying to reverse that, but we took most of that 96% out of the air. Wow, well, not we, the earth did. Because we happen to have life that transformed and propagated. Now, in the last 800,000 years, we've gotten into a period of, you know, um, ice ages and between the ice uh, uh, interglacial periods. And this last one, the Holocene, is about 11,000 years, and here's the top of that. This is when we got civilization, culture, agriculture. Uh, we we're not the rough nomads, okay, that we had been. Uh, and so it's kind of neat, but it was going kind of like maybe we're at the end of our time. Well, guess what? We reversed that. No worries. It's not going to get cold. Uh, you might want it to. Now, the last 1,500 years uh, has been bouncing around a little bit. And all of these data are really taken from proxies, ice cores and this and that and everything. But the last little bit's from instrumentation, i.e. thermometers. Okay. Uh, now, this is record years for temperature since 1880 in the U.S. And, of course, the next year was a record because it beat 80. The next year happened to be because it beat 81. But then, not till 90. And it's been moving up. And the last three years have been records. Now, I'm going to have you watch because we're going to see this build. And you're going to see it stays along here a long time before we finally break away on all these records. See, it's not really jumping much. Okay, World War II. Now V8 engines going crazy. Population V8 engines. Boom, boom, boom. We've been accelerating. I'm going to go back and let you see that one more time. World War II was in there, now we're 60, 70. Okay. And, and, and we've been kind of going crazy recently. Um, that's a problem. Um, it's a big problem. So, now the question, what about 2017? Well, the 2015 and 2016 were El Nino years. So, that helped us to get it to go up. 2017's not. So actually, on the land and ocean temperatures, we're in number two, just barely above number three. 
and we don't have an El Nino. And number three had an El Nino. That's a little bit scary. Uh, and on the ocean only, we're in number three because we don't have an El Nino, so we drop down. Um, and uh, now, you know, we just happened to have a day um, last February where it hit 80 at DIA, 79 in Denver, which is the old place where records were. And it had been 71 was the record. We broke a record by eight degrees, nine officially, but by eight on uh, apples for apples. Eight degree, I mean, that's a five sigma kind of thing. That's not a random event. And guess what? Same time. It was 99 degrees, 98, 95 in Oklahoma. Wow. Okay, you get freak stuff, but that's really freak. Now, hey, this week, November 27th, three days ago, what did we have? Well, it was 81 at DIA. Let's be in Denver and make it fair. 78 versus 74. So we, we broke by four in Denver. Wow. And coming to us, this came from California, and in Camarillo, um, it was 99. The old record was 90. Now, just like we, our record was also a record for the whole month, and it was at the end of the month, this is a record for the whole month in that part of California, and it was toward the end of the month. Wow, we're, we're getting some extreme stuff, and uh, time's a waste, and we got to do something. I like time's a waste, and I think that was from Little Abner or something like that. But anyway, uh, and after it left us, that heat went that away, because here we've we just, you know, cool down. And guess what? Yesterday, November 29th, Greenland, there's places on Greenland that were as much as 54 degrees above normal in Greenland. Now, this is winter. What happens in Greenland? It, it's icy, right? Uh, and this is what's predicted to be coming in eight days. And this is a polar vortex. So... We got this up and down and up and down. And so this month is climate-wise totally turned upside down. We've got three records in here that I circled, and we got four near records in here in Denver. And that's why I figured put it on upside down because the whole thing's turned upside down. Now, the jet stream gives you these high areas and low areas. And since we've so heated the Arctic relative to the temperate zone. We're not getting the same propulsion across around the world that we used to have. So things are getting um, kind of messed up and freaky. That's a highly technical term, freaky, okay? Um, it, it's far, far too technical for some of our current administration in Washington. Um, but uh, anyway... Uh, now, the IPCC, International um, uh, Panel on Climate Change, has charts that they came up with several years ago, and this is emissions from fossil fuels and cement in billions of tons of CO2 per year, gigatons of CO2 per year, and billions of tons were putting out per year, and it was around 20 and then up 25, 30, and it's getting near 40, and I don't have a later one than the, 24, or the 2014 estimate. But these are, if we do this and this and this as a world population versus that and that and that, and we phase this in at a certain time and phase that, here's all these scenarios for where we'll be. And the colors come down to, we'll end up by 2100 being over 1,000 parts per million. If we're over 1,000 parts per million, we've all lost IQ points. By studies, CO2 puts you to sleep and makes you far less sharp. And so the colors, you get over there. And so we're going that way, and we need to really, by 2020, get turned and going down as a world. Okay, as a world. So, um, and so let's just see what, if we don't do anything, if we do business as usual, we get to RCP 8.5, and if we are really, really good, we get to RCP 2.6. Well, the world will look like that or like that. Those aren't good. Now, where's all this heat going? Okay, 
Well, most of it's going in the ocean. Wow, 93 plus, I'm going to call it 94, and then 2% in the atmosphere, 2% in the continents, and 2% to all the ice put together. I just want to lump the ice, okay? And so uh, just think, if the ocean weren't sucking that up, it would be going all over there. So we'd have the atmosphere getting about 15 times more and the continents 15 times more and the glaciers and other ice 15 times more. Wow. So that bit of water is doing, we need to say thank you to that water because it's kind of saving our backsides, okay? Um, It's a buffering thermal mass for us, a buffering thermal mass. So we really need to say we love you oceans. All together, we love you oceans. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so, so now, it, what if it didn't suck it up? Well, then they get 15 times more, and what would that do? So if we were targeted at a 2-degree C rise, that would be a 30-degree C warming. Wow. By the end, and a 15 times more ice melt, if, if that was going to give a 3-foot C rise, and the estimates for the end of the century were between 3 and 9, depends on who you talk to. But, uh, you know, then it's 45 to 135 feet. Woo! And 15 times more continent warming. Well, you don't want to walk around barefoot. Let's just say that. You want to have a well-insulated bottom on your shoe with the continents warming. Now, the side effect, or the bad thing is, the ocean's warming up that much, and this is just the last 25 years. Just the last 25 years. And the oceans are warming up. That is um, going to be a problem uh, because hot oceans make bigger hurricanes, which move slower, dumping more water. And... The warmer air is also uh, bringing and holding more water, so it's staying longer, dumping more. And now, also, you get more heavy downpours that last two days or more. Probability of heavy downpours uh, of two-day duration or more goes up. Uh, So, and we saw a heavy downpour, right? Houston. Um, And, by the way, Harvey was the greatest rainfall event in American recorded history, and probably even prehistoric. So more water, more flooding. The scale on there, the dark blue is 40 inches or more, and there are places that got to 50 inches or more. Now, the probability, there were studies made on the future probability of that kind of rain. And during the... 1980 to 2000 period, that was considered a 1% chance. But in the end of this coming century, if we don't change things, it's considered to be a 17% chance, or one year out of six we'll get that kind of a a storm if we don't change things. And at 2017 now, the extrapolation by the scientists came out that it was a 7% chance. So that was not as rare, according to these studies, as you might think. I have references on the bottom. Now, here's Irma. This popping up and down is Andrew in 92. Now, Andrew is a famous storm. It was a very famous storm. It caused building codes to be totally rewritten. So hurricane ties that hold everything together, metal things, rat-a-tat padded in uh, when you're doing the framing of a house, that's all because of that little guy. Irma is that big guy, and it was five times the destructive power. So now we've been talking about heat going in the oceans and consequences. Also, some CO2 goes in the ocean, but not 93.4 or 94%, 50%. So 50% of the carbon dioxide that we trap in the atmosphere is going into the ocean. And so let's go underwater to where this is doing something. And I, I love these. I, I have real good experts that are underwater. They're right here in Sherman's Lagoon. Okay? Now, in Sherman's Lagoon, uh, uh, you see, hey, Ernest, tell me about ocean acidification. Well, it affects shell-forming animals the worst. The worst. He maybe should have said the most. But, you know, English isn't his first language. Uh, but anyway, like pteropods, which are snails, and they are the base of the marine food chain. So 
ocean acidification is affecting the base of the food chain because it will dissolve the shells. You don't have a shell and you're not a protected animal anymore, okay? Um, so pteropods are in trouble. Here they are. They're kind of cute. You know, I, you might want to have one as a pet. I don't know. Okay, but now back uh, to the discussion. But it's really bad on plankton. Plankton, poor little guys. Okay. Wow, plankton. And here's the kicker. They produce over half of all the oxygen that beach apes need to breathe. Now, if you're out on the beach and you're in your bikini or your monokini or you're on one of those other beaches and you don't have a kini, then you, what you breathe, half of it's coming from, you know, the Brazilian rainforests or Thailand or this or that. The other half's coming from the ocean. And so it, it would be kind of nasty if the soil or the, the, the uh, ocean acidification bothered that. So anyway, we got out of the water now, and guess what's happened? Oh, here, here's our beach, uh, keeny list, folks. Um, but the angel of the Lord comes down and says, holy crap, God gives you humans a planet to tend, and you turn the oceans into acid. Whoa. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, oops, and our bad. You know, they're highly literate, these our little uh, beach uh, roamers here. Um, okay, back underwater. What are we going to do about it? Well, I won't sit idly by while shell-forming animals around the world are in trouble. A good, honorable statement. And the only way to slow down ocean acidification is to use less fossil fuels. Now, it's not the only way, but it's a real good way. It's the biggest and most likely way. So the phrase, use less fossil fuels, but who's going to do it? Where and when? I mean, time's getting, you know, moving on. Now, Nadarev Sanyo addressed that, and he's at IPCC meeting about three or four years ago, and he's a representative from the Philippines. And while he was there, his home was being destroyed by a monster typhoon in the Philippines. And he had been trying to get a hold of his family, and he couldn't get through. He didn't know if they were dead or alive. And he said on the floor of the uh, conference, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? If not here, then where? And that pretty much gets down to it. It either somebody does it, or everybody does it, or it ain't going to happen. Now, let's talk sea level rise for a second. How bad could it be? Well, if, if you melted everything, now that takes a long, 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 long time, Greenland will give you 24 feet of sea rise. All of Antarctica will give you just under 200 feet. Well, that's a lot, you know. Um, and the West Antarctic grounded ice sheet uh, interior reservoir well 18 to 20 okay now many islands are flat this is the capital of the Maldives this is Singapore a nation state real flat and we have these Greenland glaciers and we have Antarctic glaciers and you got two miles of ice in a lot of places deep Glaciers meet the sea, and there's uh, an ocean uh, belting Greenland mission to find out. But the warm, salty water, because our oceans are warmer, are going up the undercutting where this is sliding in and causing it to crack and come off. And this is happening on glaciers all over the place. Um, th th by the way, th this mission, the OMG, intentionally named to be, oh, my God, mission. Um, okay. Now, when the icebergs come off, uh, you know, there's, you can go out and watch the parade if you're in eastern Canada. They come sailing by. Kind of a neat view, I would guess. Um, and then this is a big one that broke off down in Antarctica. And uh, the size of Delaware. Now, NASA decided two and almost a half years ago that the West Antarctic... Uh, grounded interior reservoir was past the point of no return. In other words, it's happening and there's no stopping it. We're at that point. It, it was not a future maybe, it's a yes now, it's happening. And, but how long, you don't know. Uh, where the owner, uh, warmer ocean is undercutting 
and that we will sometime, not in my life, your life, I don't know, but it's going to happen. Now, this is where the Delaware size thing went, and this is another place, not just the West Antarctic, that's doing it. Now, Shanghai, an interesting city. Shanghai is named for what happened and how it's there because there was seismic activity in the east of China, and that seismic activity gave a lift to what was underwater, and so it means above sea. Old Shanghai came up out of the ocean, and that's what Shanghai, above sea, means. But now, that's where this picture is taken from. That's old the Bund, and everybody's there doing their, uh, their exercise at 6 in the morning, twisting around, uh, staying flexible. But that was marsh. When I was there in 1982, that was marsh across the river. And that's new Shanghai, because China's been developing very rapidly and very dramatically. And, you know, just think, the potential new name, undersea. And so I, I did a little research, and that's G. And, and so there's the symbol. So it'll get a new name. Now, that's not the only town that'll get a new name. Oh, first, you know, um, if it rises, all of this, uh, New York, London, and even if, if you get a total melt, uh, the river valleys, there's a lot of capitals like Paris, Bonn, that are not that much above sea level, so the river valley you get water in. And now the interesting thing is, if we get a full melt, look at the eastern seaboard. We lose all the eastern seaboard, and, and Florida's just totally gone, you know, just totally gone. But so Miami is gone. So really, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, the new Miami, will be renamed Palm Bluff on the bay because you'll have this big inland waterway. So, so Shanghai uh, changes from Shanghai. And it's a, invest in Pine Bluff. It'll be Palm Bluff, and it'll be quite a resort community. The developers will be down there really working on it. Okay. Now, talking about Florida, though, uh, the governor, Scott, he ordered a prohibition on the terms climate change and global warming for all of his staff. And when he caught people that used those terms, they had a month off without pay. Yeah. No, he was serious about this. And uh, uh, so who are his uh, constituents? It's not the citizens. And he's encouraging development along all the undeveloped beachfront. Um, now, he's gotten a friend that's joined him because uh, this young man here, not so young actually, but he's younger than me, so that's okay. Uh, he moved all climate information from the web and all the printed literature that is put out by the US DOE has climate and global warming removed totally out of the literature. Totally. So a total melt does a lot of things. You get inland seas all over the place. And, oh, the uh, northern France, well, just it, it devastates no Netherlands, no Denmark, no Belgium. Everything is gone. Um, uh, Venice <laughs> is really no thoughts of it. Caspian Sea is big. Um, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania are gone. Lots of things happen. And uh, Beijing and everything around it's gone, and Shanghai and everything around it. A lot of the good rice crop land is gone. Um, so, uh, and then uh, Java, Sumatra, uh, the Philippines, uh, Borneo, and you get some inland seas in Australia. Lots of things happen. Now, there's another thing that they're just starting to relate to it, and that is earthquakes. This is the earthquake in Mexico this summer, in Mexico City. And you see the rubble rising, the dust rising here. And uh, there's two good, one is from the Guardian and the other's uh, Newsweek articles that talk about what can happen here and uh, how er climate can affect the Earth's crust. So, and before we get, remember I said we got a molten mass in the middle and then we got a crust and then we got some water and some air. Well, if you got two miles of ice down there, and in places two miles here, that's been pushing down, right? When that melts, it's no longer pushing down, and all that water comes around 
and it's pushing in. So it's a matter of just adjusting for the pressure when you're not pushing that way and you are pushing that way. That crust has all these little lines. And by the way, this was this morning, and it's a 6.7 out on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Um, so anybody that wants to test out the pushing, go ahead, and you can see that it does work. You push here versus there, and the crust moves around. I mean, I, I like simple, practical physics, elementary school physics. It works. Okay. Of course, when you do earthquakes, what comes with it? Well, yes, that's uh, Fukushima. And in the water, I mean, the mice that we're eating out of the dumpster there are going to have a rude awakening in two milliseconds because it's coming their way. Um, so uh, I, I want to be hopeful, but yet understand that that sea of acidification, plankton, okay, we lose breathing, uh, air, pteropods, we lose the food chain, uh, warm sea, stronger storms, slower weather movements, longer droughts, and longer storms, more floods, more air moisture gets more floods, ice melts, surface water pressure cause earthquakes, and uh, with sea rise you get re refugees and you get civil uh, unrest. Uh, so that's why we got this guy here. Um, and, uh, and then, so there's a slow climate apocalypse. Now, we have, it's in our own, I say slow is the key word, but only slow on a human thought scale, not on a uh, geological. It's blazing fast in geological time. I mean, this is blazing fast. So it may uh, make it seem unimportant and uh, deferable to humans that it's a slow thing. It's much slower than the news cycle and therefore ignored. But that conclusion risks condemning mankind and other parts of nature. So now we get to the ethics. Okay. <laughs> yeah, see, this is HIS thinking, head and sand thinking. Uh, and and uh, this is a social disease to have this kind of thinking. It really is a social disease. Um, and it presents a certain part of the anatomy, and therefore the, the people might do things that cause Arctic methane to be released, or methane else, or I don't know. But So the leadership of this HIS uh, activity, the mantra is of the rich, by the rich, and for the rich, because, as it says in the fine print, yes, the planet got destroyed, but for a beautiful moment in time, we created a lot of value for shareholders. <laughs> okay, because that's all that really matters is value for shareholders. Okay. Um, now, at a, a climate conference, there's always got to be one person that says, what if it's a big hoax? Okay, so uh, anyway, uh, but now we're in ethics here. So, you know, there's a lot of good statements from folks somewhere. We must make it clear that we're concerned about the si uh, survival of the world. Mm. And you either have to be part of the solution or you're going to be part of the problem. So part of the solution, part of the problem. That was in, you know, when that was said in the 60s, it was about race relations and it was very real. But that was a matter of business as usual is the common problem because business as usual means vested interests. And vested interests propel unethical activities against the commons, the air, the water, the general folks. That's the commons. So a livable climate is a civil rights issue. I really believe it is the foundational civil rights issue. If you don't have a livable climate, you don't have differences between different people. You're not, everybody's in, so there's no greater civil rights issue. Okay, now, I care because I got grandkids, but I care about all people's grandkids. And so kids born here, they grow up a little, they grow up more, they grow up more, and they get bent over and have a cane. Now, all the colors here. This is average days per year over 95 degrees. Average days over 95 degrees. So you can see that, you know, we've got a lot of green up here. The dark green is less than 10 days. The medium green 
is uh, uh, less than 20 days. You don't get much of that out here toward the end of the century, but you've got a lot of red and a lot of pink. And uh, the dark red, well, you're over 200 days in the purples here. Over 200 days, over 95 degrees. Well, now, I, I think there's a real problem air conditioning when it's like that out. Yeah, that becomes not livable, and it affects food production. So Santa, and uh, I, I have a Santa on Santa's bike that he rode um, uh, to, for deliverers before he got the Wright brothers to come up and teach the reindeer how to fly, which happened in 1904. But anyway, uh, an ethical plea from Santa. It says, please save my workshop floor from melting. It was 20 foot thick, and now it's only 10 foot thick. And he sees it as elves and, and all his tooling investment going. And, and Santa is dedicated to the children, so that's why I throw this in here, because we just had the children and the transformations. So now part of ethics is a responsibility for action, i.e., connecting actions to our values. Dalai Lama said, it's our responsibility, and I'll put the, fill, the missing words in in a minute, to preserve and tend to the environment in which we all live. That's our responsibility, to preserve it and tend to it. Okay, the missing words are collective and individual, not just some group, but us and we. And this whole idea is an inconvenient truth because it says we got to do something. That's Gore's term, Gore's movie, Gore's book. It is an inconvenient truth. But the Dalai Lama has said that. So let's look. Individual citizens, we need to do stuff but governments or collectives, corporations, and religious or organizations and NGOs. Okay. As an individual citizen, our responsibility is to take personal action and clean up our carbon lifestyle and to do advocacy and be part of the collectives. And that means we need to vote, petition, testify, canvas, demonstrate, and boycott where needed. And the government green policy, uh, facilitation, strict enforcement, carbon clean agencies, corporations, products and operations that are clean, uh, and then religious organizations and NGOs doing good stuff. Now, I got a chance to talk to uh, Bill McKibben. Uh, he is the master of advocacy. 350.org is his organization. And he was a professor in a, a uh, New England college. Um, but uh, uh, he's responsible for the fossil fuel divestiture movement. And along with the Guardian newspaper in England, they're programmed to keep it in the ground, meaning keep oil in the soil. Hmm, that's catchy. And keep coal in the hole. So coal in the hole, oil in the oil, uh, soil. Now, Pope Francis, he, he does it on an individual and a collective. He wrote a book, and I'm going to pass out two copies to just let go around a little bit. Um, and uh, uh, this was in 2015 in the spring, um, and he gave Trump one. I'm going to send Trump another one um, <laughs> because I don't know if Trump reads Latin and this is English. But so he, he, after he wrote this, actually when he moved in, uh, he didn't move in the papal residence. He moved into one of the little visitor things. And there's PV panels all over the Vatican. Now, I, I'm, I'm not a Catholic, but this guy, he's good. He's real, real good. You don't need to be a Catholic to say this guy is good. And I'll listen to him because he's got, he's not just talking about climate there. He's talking about a lot of things in there. But climate is in there. Caring for, it's on care for our common home. Now, Nelson Mandela on individual action. You can never have an impact on society if you've not changed yourself. You got to do yourself. And everybody knows, Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world and a lot of other very, but be the change because it's not going to happen if you don't. Now, Eleanor Rosa, one's philosophy is not best expressed in words. It exp is expressed in the choices one makes and the choices we make are ultimately our responsibility. And that's her as a young lady. And I think as an older lady, she looked back and I think she was proud of what she did. Okay. Now, this is kind of interesting because it says, do what needs to be done. Don't 
check to see if it's possible first. Because you'll be told it's not. You'll be told it's not. So don't do that. Only check after you're done if it was impossible. And a similar, another twist on that, people who say it cannot be done should not interrupt those that are doing it. <laughs> okay, just, I'm going to ask somebody to open that to get a little bit of fresh air in because the CO2 level in here is now up at about 2,000 parts per million. It is. I, for another talk that was in here, I had a meter and it got up there. And so, um, the, otherwise, you'll all be asleep. Um, so, and I don't want it to be that it's my fault. So, Albert Schweitzer. Example is not the main thing in influencing others. It's the only thing. It's the only thing. Okay, but what to do and how? So now we're ready for the next section. Okay, the principles of personal sustainability, they're based on the house because in your home, that's where, number one, you can stop wasting energy and causing carbon emissions. Number two, you can collect energy from the sun or wind or whatever happens to be offering it to you. And so it's home-based. So think of your house as a soaring energy eagle. You know, eagles, they, they can soar and soar. They have a long glide ratio. Uh, it's interesting. A pilot of a glider plane, um, he can go 60 miles for one mile of elevation. And on a uh, 747, you can get 17. On a Cessna 270, you can get seven and a half. And the uh, space shuttle on landing, when it's coming down, uh, it gets four and a half for one because it doesn't have much lift in the wings. But an eagle, I think it's much better than the glider uh, that people are in at 60. So think of, of your house as that. And think of it in the sense of thermal. So the glide path and the eagle, where there's a thermal coming up, it can catch it and ride up. So think of your house as something that wants to glide efficiently and wants to catch thermals, which is renewable energy. So the thermal glide path and catching thermal lift. And so we want biomimicry in our actions with our houses, okay? Make it soar like a good energy eagle. Now, more biomimicry, just notice, you want efficiency, and a lot of stuff is copied off, so we want to copy the eagle. So the discipline titled Passive House is about making your house be sealed and insulated so very well that it glides a long way rather than going down and have to be heated up and down and heated up. Catching thermal lift, passive solars for that, and photovoltaics catch energy. Now, efficiency, I kind of like, you look at this guy, and he's, he's totally streamlined. That's a seal. And it's kind of interesting because he's got this great fur coat and he's got a good smile, so I had to throw him in just for the fun of it. Okay. And, by the way, polar bears are well insulated too. You want your house to be insulated better than a polar bear and a seal. And notice, he's got a little caboose. And if you want to keep your hair, get a good coat, insulate to cover your climate butt. Okay. Now, we're back to the eagle. And he's going to get a little title that you're going to have to remember. My building operations uh, energy approach is to catch it and keep it. Catch the sun or the wind and keep it. Catch it and keep it. That's catch it for renewables, keep it for insulate and seal. And so I want you all to say, catch it and keep it. Catch it and keep it. Thank you. Okay, so catching the sun as energy, photovoltaics, as daylight, sun tunnels, skylights, as heating, passive solar, uh, for cooking, sun ovens, uh, as food, photosynthesis, grow stuff, uh, and for transportations, well, the PV and electric car. We'll get more details. Now, about catching sunlight, um, Jimmy Carter, two miles from here, over the hill, uh, at NREL, it was SARI then, Solar Energy Research Institute, uh, said nobody can bar embargo sunlight. We just had an oil embargo, so he said that. Uh, and no cartel controls the sun. 
and its energy will not run out. Not for practical purposes, you know. Uh, so the world's got a lot of solar resources. And if Germany can do as good as they're doing way up in the light yellow, the U.S. is fine. We just need to do it. So, but more important than catching is keeping what you got. Okay? So you want to seal the air leaks, super insulate, add vestibules or airlocks um, so you stop drafts, efficient windows, efficient furnaces and water heaters, efficient appliances, efficient LED lighting, uh, and light-colored walls so that the light that they get bounces more times <laughs> at the speed of light. <laughs> That's what light moves at, is the speed of light. Uh, and then uh, seasonal clothing choices. So that helps you keep uh, it. Now, a preview, you're going to see what happened to do this. My house, the carbon emissions from the year 2000, it got to net zero in 2007 and then went under net zero. Now, by adding in growing oranges of a few kinds and, and running electric cars, I'm pretty much up to even now because I'm hitting those other functions. And so, um, what does this carbon footprint re represent? Well, the operational. There's operational energy to run a house. And there's also the embodied energy to make a house. So you got the operational and the body. So in my house, it's natural gas and electricity. People might have fuel oil. They might have propane. Uh, and, um, but it doesn't include the embodied energy. But we're going to talk just a little bit about embodied energy uh, in a minute. So the electricity looked like that. And this was CFL bulbs. That was PV, more PV, more PV. I went back for more because it tasted so good. <laughs> and I've seen some of you go back for second cookies, too. And it tastes good. Um, and then natural gas. By the way, when the CFLs went in, the natural gas use went up because I was no longer heating the house in the winter with the incandescent bulbs. You see it in the data. And, and then I got new windows. And that undid that. Then some insulation. And then this was, I replaced the old furnace, which was a 60 to 65% with a 95% furnace. And that, for $3,000, did more than $18,000 on windows did. Ooh. People aren't pushing furnaces at you, but they're pushing windows at you. Right? Okay. Uh, and then I built a couple sunrooms, and I kept insulating, 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 and insulating some more. And so, now, embodied energy. When you build a house, all the energy that's involved is embodied. It's what went in to the materials in the building of the house. Once you start living in the house, then you got operational energy. And so it moves toward 50-50 and then goes, takes 17 years for a house that was built to 2010 codes to have a, that the operational energy equals the embodied energy. 17 years. So that says that if you scrape an old house and you've thrown a wall away all that embodied energy and then build another, you're 17 years of catching up to what you put in on the new house. So I say building a new greenhouse is not being green. Instead, fix up an old house, and I call it an orphan house. We're going to talk about orphanages now. Everybody ready for orphanages? Okay. So adopt an existing or orphan house and transform it with orphan materials. Okay. Sounds easy. And you can do it. Just step by step. So I tried to find a nice picture for Orphanage, and there's a movie called Orphanage, so that's what I threw up there. Because I got the eagle for catch it and keep it. And so now for the uh, embodied energy uh, orphanage. And then operate it below uh, that zero. So now the orphan house, the embodied energy is a sunken energy and carbon cost. And the orphan materials, that's like, so you're not involving a new carbon cost or a new uh, energy cost. And, um, okay, where do you get orphan houses? Well, you, you just buy a house wherever, okay? You know, an, an old one. And orphan materials. Well, Habitat for Humanity's got restores. Uh, Lowe's is fantastic because it has a lot of misorders that come back. And all the stuff that didn't work for folks, it's brand new, perfect shape, you get for 75 or 90% off. It's, it's really neat. And then there's dumpsters. 
Dumpsters can be ideal. Um, I, I, as a kid, I lived in married housing on a college campus, and we learned in June to really check out what was going on, because there's lots of good stuff. So that's still in me. Okay, so, but for the orphan, hey, you can adopt as an orphan the house you're in right now, because you may be an owner, but you may not be a parent. Okay, you might not have the maternal or paternal instinct for it. And, and so you can change your attitude and you take that orphan house that you owned and you adopt it and you work on it. Okay, here is the coal lumber rack at Lowe's. It's amazing. Anything you want. Now, on a 16-foot board, it may have 12 straight feet and four curly foot. Fine. You just paid for a four foot piece because you got it 75% off and you got a good 12 footer and you got a scrap that you might be able to do something with on the last. So it's amazing. I, I've only used orphan wood. This is the stuff people go to do a project. That's good. That's good. That's not. That's good. That's good. That's not. They get bundled up. They get out here. They're marked between 50 and 75% off, but they'll always, if it's marked 50% off, you can always get it by offering. 25% of the retail. Okay, and miss orders. Windows and doors. This right here label is right there. It is a sliding patio door of good quality. All the pieces are there. They're not hurt. And it says was $1,384 for $150. These things that didn't fit come back, and they sit there, and the price goes down 30% and then 45 and you know, and when they get down to the price that you're happy with, you buy it. You miss some, I've gotten amazing things. Okay, dumpsters. I picked up some of that. Price is right. I did ask. This is what's now the uh, Islamic um, uh, temple in uh, Golden. And that was the old roof that uh, was a SIP panel. And I did call the architect and got the name of the uh, uh, the people that are, run, that are going to be running it and I asked permission to go into their dumpster and they were happy that I was going to do that and I've used that. It's SIP panels, insulation between two sheets of OSB or in a strand board. Okay, so my operations are catch it and keep it and the embodied energy is orphanage for both the initial structure and materials. So it's the operation, again, that. So I've got my orphanage and I got my eagle. And now, <coughs> energy currency. Energy currency is what you spend to get something done. So, the kind of it, a process or an application. And there's ones that I colored black and one's green. And these are the fossil fuel. They have first cost, recurring cost, and enduring environmental consequence. Now these, have first cost recurring dividends and avoided consequences. Oh, that sounds like the better deal. But not all of these are created equal. And intermittency you could ask about because that's what people like to ask about. So because of intermittency, you have banks for energy currencies. So you can put heat in thermal mass like tram walls, phase change materials, climate batteries, rock boxes. There's esoteric like springs, compressed air, net metering, hot salts and flywheels, and then the white color to bounce the light around. If you paint the whole thing black, it's dark in here. If it's white, a little bit of light goes a long way. It gets boop, 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 boop. And just like that with those sounds. Okay, now there's applications in your house, things you wanna do. And in deciding what energies to use, what applications, there's an issue called fungibility. Which currencies are the most broadly applicable? Uh, which currencies are very fungible, that they can be used for this and that and other thing? So can uh, it be widely applied? And then is the surplus storable or transferable to somebody? Now, I selected for my house on transforming this old house to use these three, PV electricity, passive solar, and daylight. All sun. I don't have the ability to have wind because the lot's too small. And for thermal mass, I have climate batteries, just like the Mars things underneath. 
and water storage and net metering and battery backup and uh, generally white or just off-white decor. So the total thing is transform using orphans, then use very little selected renewables, and then energy banks as time buffers between when it get, comes to you and when you use it. it. That's what a bank is. It's a time buffer between when you get it and when you want to use it, okay? So that's the main summary of guiding principles. So now let's see it being done. So PV, electricity, is going to do an awful lot of stuff. And then passive daylight and sun ovens is going to do a bunch, of, but with backup at night of PV to be used, of the electricity to be used. And then grow your own food and you use passive with, you know, the green in there is taking the sunshine and doing good stuff. Now, so PV on the roof, that's part of it. Sun tunnels, this gets light in, amazing light in, even on the north side. I do the 14 inch or the 20, these are all 22s, those are 14. And they light the place. I don't have lights on in the day in the upstairs. I have six of those. Seven with one that's just doing the attic. So if I want to go up in the attic, I can see everything real well. Uh, okay, daylighting. That's what it looks like on the inside. Everything, there's no lights on. There's no shades are up and down on all the windows. White paint, I say avoid interior decorators. There's people called interior decorators. And what do they do? They put dark, stylish colors on. I don't call them decorators. I call them decorators because they make it so you need a lot more light. Remember, interior decorators, avoid them. Okay. Because white paint is to lighting as insulation is to heating and cooling. Okay. Sun oven for cooking. Passive solar for heating. We're going to come back. This is the back of the house with some changes to catch the sun. Then a heat pump water heater, this is the heat pump, and there's a 50-gallon tank. Instead of natural, I got rid of the natural gas line for that. I still have a little bit for that, but that's going to be gone really, really soon. For, I, I used evaporative cooling, but that's going to be gone really, really soon uh, because a heat pump, an air-to-air heat pump, is amazingly efficient, uh, powered by uh, photovoltaic panels. And here is what I've just ordered, a mini split heat pump to replace the um, evaporative cooler and to replace the gas furnace. Because I've reduced my gas furnace usage by 97%. So I don't need to have a big furnace. And these are amazingly efficient. This will pull heat out of the outside air at an outside temperature of minus 14 degrees. Minus 14, and it's going to productively pull heat out of that. The Japanese, ever since Fukushima, have been really working on how to live without nuclear power. And so, uh, now efficient appliances, uh, clothes dry. This is a passive solar. Uh, there's a shade that can come down here, and there's, but you walk in there, and it's that wide, clothesline going down each side. For seven years, that's all I've dried clothes in, sheets and everything. I walk in, 24-7, passive solar clothes dryer. It doesn't dry fast, but it humidifies the house. So save some other functions. And there's looking down and seeing the clothesline and seeing some stuff on the line. Okay, food production. You know, this is the vineyard. That's the veggies. There's some poor fruit trees there and there and there. This is where they get uh, dried. This is the top of a passive solar um, uh, heating the house. And there's shelves. And there's the grapes becoming raisins. Works real well. Kale become kale chips. Pumpkin slices a quarter inch thick. They become potato chips thickness. Really nice. Not much flavor. You can solve them if you want. I don't. Um, now. Ventilation, powered by electricity. You need to, if you seal a house real well, you need to bring some fresh air in and get the old air out. So an energy recovery ventilator. And here's where the energy, the fresh air comes in. There's where it goes out. The come in, it comes down and just inside the wall here, we have that. And so the air is going that way and the other air is coming that way and it hands off 
the warmth. It's just a handoff. Inside there, there's a magic little box, and it says, the warmth stays in and the dirty air goes out. Now, transportation. Walk, hike, bike, shared ride, solar-powered electric car, or monster equipment mover. Okay, walk. Well, you've got to have different kinds of shoes and slippers. Bike. You know, I like to cycle recycled cycles because the embodied energy was put in, you know, 135 years ago. And it, it works. You don't have to get one that old, but it works. Uh, so adopt an orphan wheel. Okay. Um, now, shared rides. I was in India, and, and I just couldn't pass this up. And, and I went like that to them, and they went like that, and I went click. And I thought, you know, isn't that the greatest shared ride you ever saw? And this guy's already closed, the, you know, church in the steeple, but he's already closed. But the others still have him up. And uh, carpooling and hitchhiking qualify. Okay, transportation. So uh, bikes to old heavy cars. These are V8 Fords that came by to see my bike museum. To, this is an early hybrid. It's got a gas and a pedal. And it's a serial hybrid. It's not a parallel hybrid. You, you use the one, and then you use the other. And, and then here's a Prius. It's a parallel hybrid because you're using the gas and the electric interchangeably. But then a Chevy Volt is a serial hybrid. It uses the electric that you've plugged in, and then when that runs out, it runs gas. So that's the same kind of serial, one after the other instead of in parallel. And then uh, Tesla and uh, another Tesla. And so anyway, transportation. And I, I just love that picture because it kind of made a statement a long time ago. Um, by the way, you could buy Corvettes that are 15 years old for less than you'd sell them five or 10 years later when they're a better collector thing. And they paid for themselves. I went through six Corvettes at one time before I totally said, okay, I gotta be electric. And, and, and I carried around bikes. Um, so there once was a myth about electric cars. That was that they were just for golf carts and nerdmobiles. So then a super nerd from South Africa made one car of the year. That was a Tesla Model S. And now GM this year made one car of the year. And that's the Chevy Bolt, B as in boy, O-L-T. Two car of the years that are, are um, electric cars, all electric. Now, this is kind of neat because really the myth of nerdness is here is an Alfa Romeo, here's an Alfa Romeo on a trailer behind a Tesla Model X. This is a drag strip. Bang, they go, and guess what? That Alfa Romeo is behind this trailer at the quarter mile. So it's not quite a nerd mobile when it can pull a trailer in another. Okay, and you power it from the house with the PV on the roof. Now, I still have that for hauling building materials. Okay, and that's gasoline. So what model do we say when we see this eagle? Catch it and keep it. Catch it and hold is good. I take that. Okay. Again? Catch it and catch keep it. it. Catch it and keep it. Okay, good. So catch it and keep it. So now for the keep. The long, shallow glide path. Seal and insulate, 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 insulate. And insulate some more. <laughs> because as the president said, <laughs> insulation is sexy. You got that? He said that. I, I loved it when he said that. Because, you know, you want to be warm or you don't feel up to it. So personal insulation, your first two levels for personal insulation. So long johns, et cetera, and nice warm sweater. And on your bed, you know, good qu uh, quilt over your uh, uh, warm layers on your bed. Adding to the attic. This is about the most important place. But before you add, and I didn't do it because I didn't know it then, you scoot what you have back, and you seal all the seams where your inside walls are because you do get air leaks. And if you get a good professional company to do an attic insulation blow for you, they will offer you that service at a premium, but you won't get the XL rebate unless you do take that because it makes a big difference. So you seal all those seams where there's drywall coming across, and then you see a two by four, and then drywall, and that's an inside wall. Because otherwise, there is stuff that comes in uh, through the 
electrical outlets on the interior walls and works its way up and gets into the You can chimney out a lot of heat if you have not sealed all those seams in your attic. So, um, so here I was, uh, the first time I went up in the attic and blew insulation, I blew a lot and I was proud of myself. Well, I went up again and blew more. And then I had professionals take the rim, uh, uh, the ridge vents off and blow more. Uh, here is an example of that. And so it's totally filled. Cellulose is good stuff. You put cellulose in areas that are dry. You don't put it inside foundation walls where you have a something because there you can get some moisture and you don't want to have that wetness. So here's a wall that goes down like that and so fiberglass in the mid wall cavity. Then I thickened walls. This is polyisocyanate foam sheets that I layered up and that corner is in that bedroom right there and I, it, it went from an R9 wall to an R60 wall and so the heat loss by the walls reduced 85%. I, I gave up space in the room, okay? That's okay. Here is the dining room layering in again. 7.5 inches of polyiso at R7 per inch, so that's R52 add to an R9 wall. And then I actually, and there it is when it's done, because I put, um, yeah, you can open that again if you like to get some airflow, and I will try to be done very soon. So thicken walls, and then outside, where I couldn't do the inside, I thickened, and there's that. And then uh, on another side, I took the siding off, saved it, put it back up later, and thickened, and got to there, and then dig the foundation wall. Now, when I was a young man, I did this in Illinois. Young meaning 45, something like that. And, and you, you do it with shovels. And you put, there I did two inches of pink board and got R8. Here I did four inches of polyiso and got R28. As an old man, if I'm going to do that much work, I'm going to get value out of it. <laughs> okay? And you put it down in. Overhangs, quite often they're not done. Then airlock entries. The White House has an airlock entry called a vestibule. Houses used to have vestibules. My house has a lot of vestibules now. Okay, so the catch it, I built a big solar catcher back here, actually in two parts. I drew plans. I took off the old deck that was rotten and needed to be replaced, and I started to build with... Okay, and... And that's it, and the downstairs of it is a workshop, and I'm growing oranges in there, a couple kinds. And then an extra little workshop outside the workshop, and looking out at the bad weather. And it's also for storing my squash. And then this is the before the first. Uh, by the way, I got rid of that fireplace because it leaked. It made it cold all the time. If it was on, the house was cold because it was hot in place, but it's sucking in cold air. And if it was off, it was just leaking. So that's what that got done to. And then there's more space over here facing south. So it's over here. Now, you could have done things just on the layer like that, and that's, but then I decided, no, I was going to do a bigger thing. I drew pencil, straight edge, graph paper for my designs to get my building permit. They always thought I was a little crazy, but then they liked it when it was done. Uh, and that's the west side. And this is what I was going to have facing to the south back on the... And I wanted it to look like that when I was drawing it. And by gum, it looked like that when I got done. And that's what it was before. That's what it is after. And that's what it is once the grapes grew up. And uh, so looking from the east, it looks like that back there. Those places became those. At night became those. Looking at a different angles, that. And so greenhouse in the bottom. Uh, we're going to just go through and see... So that's a view from the street. And that's a view from the street six years later. By the way, I do things slow. These are years, not months. Um, and so July 2015, and I, I did a deck on it at the same time. And so to do it, I had to dig post holes. I had to put concrete in, get sacrete and do it and uh, for the deck. And then you just start to 
layer things up and uh, away it goes. And then looking inside, that's what it looks inside, the airlock to the greenhouse. And then the greenhouse. Now, this is a climate battery. The sun comes on the south, gets hot in here, so this takes the heat and a fan, runs it down and runs it through pipes under the ground because the plants like warm toes. They'll tell you that if you ask them politely. But it warms the soil, and then overnight, that slowly oozes back up. That's what a climate battery does. That's what the Martian plan that MIT came up with. Here's six months later, the bananas and you know, some of the other stuff in there. So then here's an airlock into the upper level. So um, this, I, an airlock, I got bikes there, snowshoes there, and then in to the next level, um, which is there. And that's the gymnasium. It's got a uh, few different machines and a one foot thick envelope that catches the sun here that flows up into the top. And that envelope on a 25 degree day, it quickly got to 100 degrees when the sun got over there while it was still in the next inner room, 60. And it's 25 outside, but the sun, so that one foot is going on up and it gets up into the top, flows right up, and I go up there on that. And that's where the grapes get dried. Um, and so uh, up there, uh, it gets piped then back to the north end of the house. So now I decided I needed to put an envelope here too. So I drew pencil, straight edge, graph paper, and came up with that. And a lot of windows that were $500 windows each, really good stuff, impervia, fiberglass frame, Pella, tempered, um, neat things with good specs, and I started digging, doing the concrete, boom, boom, and it looked like that, so bloop. So now it's all done. I call it the East Promenade, and it looks like that. So I'm gonna do one more, but the Sustainable Energy Eagle did fly over and looked at it, and then he flew out to DIA, and out at DIA, he looked at the winning envelope house by the Swiss team at the uh, solar decathlon this year. And he said, wow, that's an envelope house too. And actually, it had an inner house and a whole donut perimeter rectangular around that was not heated. There was unconditioned space. And that's where they fixed bikes. Oh, I fixed bikes in mine. They grew uh, various plants. So this is captured. But not only that, but you get on the web and you find other people have approached enveloping a house differently. Just build a greenhouse over the whole house. Now, this is the envelope house at the Solar Decathlon was not a house. It was a community room because you can't really do it. You don't meet the code for every bedroom has to have egress totally outside. And this, you can't do this either, but they did. Apparently, they don't have a typical code for safety for fire exit. But anyway, um, so I've done all of those. I have bedroom windows here, bedroom windows here, bedroom there, and bedroom there. So those I can't do. Um, so going forward, I'm going to get my mini split. I've already ordered it. And that gets rid of the furnace and the vap cooler. Uh, disconnect from XL, because that's the only thing I'm doing for gas. Um, move the old furnace, make it a donation to somebody that needs a 95.5% super good furnace that's almost unused, okay? Um, and uh, uh, it's an orphan furnace at this point. And uh, then uh, build the outer front airlock entry and improve my gardening yields. Uh, so uh, and I'm going to just briefly, okay, priority items for home energy. If I were starting from scratch, here's what I'd do. Get an energy audit. I didn't do that because they weren't around when I started. Uh, replace all incandescent bulbs with LEDs. That does a lot. Seal uh, and add maximum insulation to the attics. Maximum. Don't go, well, a little bit's good. Well, a little bit more is good. I did it way too many times of little bidding. Go gangbusters, do it. Oh, I should have, uh, I didn't finish. If I am fit, or if you are fit, 
dig around your foundation, a shovel and a spade, and insulate the foundation, seal the top of that polyiso insulation with roofing tar. It'll dry hard quickly, and it's totally protected then. And if windows are aluminum framed or single glazed, upgrade to a triple or quad glaze and fiberglass frame with a good rating for the specs. Study the specs for windows. Okay, so that was um, uh, the basics. And if in doubt about how much to insulate, do more. Consider daylighting, sun tunnels, big ones, not little ones. And consider PV on the roof if appropriate. If your roof isn't appropriate, you can buy into a solar garden and your panels that are out in a community solar garden, and Golden's going to be putting one in, will then credit your thing. So you're green for your electricity from PV that you've funded, even if it's not on site. So anyway, in 2012, Ritter and the head of Cress at that time um, gave me the award for the best energy retrofit. I've continued to do stuff after that, uh, a lot of stuff. Slowly. I do nibble jobs, slowly. And by the way, th these guys agree with me. <laughs> they totally agree, and, and I, I, I respect them. Now, there's some people that don't agree. You can't please everybody all the time. And he cringes at everything I say, and he just blows smoke, smoke in my face. So again, my motivations are the kids, and interesting thing, I have three, not seven, 15, 21, or 74 kids. Um, because population is another elephant in the room. So it's, it's how many carbon footprints you spawn. How many you spawn. And therefore, we need to advocate for women's rights. And this is the march that had far more people on January 21st this year than the inaugural had. And this had all over the country and the world. And you notice the pink hats. So advocate. So anyway, that's a summary. Okay, any questions? <laughs>